Excellent. As you find your seat, I'm going to invite Sharon Pichot to come on up. Yeah, welcome Sharon. So for the last couple of weeks and for the next several weeks, we will uh, be studying the subject of deliverance. It's great, fantastic. And deliverance is really talking about this subject, this reality that a lot of what we're struggling with, the most difficult, agonizing, Ugh, what is wrong with my life? What is wrong with me? What is wrong with the world? That if we're thinking, why God? We're actually misdiagnosing the problem. It is not that God has messed up. It is not even that we have necessarily messed up. It's that we are being messed with. And so identifying the source of the problem and then learning to contend with it, uh, contend with the enemy who hates us and who is messing with us, learning to contend with the authority that Jesus has given us is uh, a source of such freedom. So uh, what's really particularly difficult about this subject, where, man, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like it's intimidating. I mean, we have authority over the enemy, so it's not like this overwhelming difficulty. But what, what makes it... Um, uh, yeah, difficult, I don't know what other, you, you know, is, is assessing what's really going on here. What, what is the enemy? And uh, very often, we just feel confused. And uh, Sharon recently was, has, was going through a situation where the Lord really helped clarify what was going on and then has begun to address it. So, Sharon, talk to us about what God's doing in your life. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I felt like um, this morning when I was sharing with Bobby kind of what I wanted to, to say. Um, first off, I'm not really comfortable up here. Um, but really the Lord just said, I'm with you. And that really gave me really the, the heart to share. Um, if I can give you a little background, a little bit of my life, but I'll be short with it. Yeah. Um, when I was about uh, nine, my parents divorced, and um, we moved out of state, and so I only saw my dad about once a year, and um, when I was between like 10 and 11, I'm not going to go into details, but really there was just a situation that happened in my life that really uh, affected me in a lot of ways. That, um, I just, it, it really kind of robbed some, you know, what, what I think the Lord had for me and just really robbed. I just didn't trust anymore. I didn't, uh, I just was really hurting in a lot of ways and didn't know how to handle it because I'm a kid, you know, I just didn't know. Um, you know, I, speeding forward, uh, you know, I get married in my first marriage and I had two beautiful daughters and um, that marriage you know, I was divorced, and um, and that was pretty hard. It was I was very devastated. I think that was kind of one of my lowest points in my life, and uh, and I had given my life to the Lord when I was young, you know, when I was probably about seven, and I remember a lot of the Sabbath school songs, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, and you know, um, and so those things always stayed in my heart. You know, I knew that he did love me. Um, so after my divorce, um, I really was very bitter, <laughs> very angry, very hurt. And um, along came Bobby. <laughs> and um, in that, both Bobby and I really wanted to have the Lord in our lives. I knew I wanted somebody who loved the Lord, who wanted the Lord. Um, and a friend of mine said I was working with and we weren't I didn't have a church I was going to at the time and she came here and she said it was Easter in fact and she said would you and Bobby like to come and I so I talked to Bobby and he goes yeah let's go so we came and uh, the worship can I just tell you I was scared to come in but once I was in the songs really spoke to me the um I felt like I was home. I felt like I was really singing to the Lord. And that made me so happy. And I knew I was in the right church, you know? And I knew this was gonna be home for Bobby and I, and he felt the same way, you know? Thank you, Lord. And um, 
speeding forward some more. <laughs> um, you know, I think bringing a blended family together has its challenges uh, that we both kind of bumped up against. And um, the thing that was so different was we had people walking with us. We had people we could go to who would pray for us, who gave us hope. The Lord gave us hope. But I mean, when you've been in such a small place, like I had several times in my life, I was like, oh, how do we handle this, you know? Um, and we did have a, such a safe, loving place where people walked with us. And that in itself was part of my deliverance. Part of it was getting healing, um, getting the prayers, getting the help that I needed so badly. And even though we were having a hard time, we loved each other. And I knew, you know, the Lord loved us. And we were going to make this work. <laughs> and he wanted it to work. Um, we had a situation that happened with uh, some of our kids, and again, it, this was something that was pretty devastating, and we didn't really know how to handle it. And um, we kind of saw things from different spectrums, and I think that kind of put me into a tailspin because I was like, you know, if we're together, we can, you know, go after whatever, you know, and here we're separated, we were, we we're apart in it. But again, we, we seeked help, we seeked uh, people that were walking with us and praying for us. Um, and they helped us uh, work our way through those things. And recently I had a prayer time like Todd was saying. And I remember um, going even to the prayer time, right? I saw Hillary in the hallway and I just- Can I interrupt just real quick oh, and insert, yes. I think an important detail. Uh, sure. The situation happened in your family, uh -huh. you guys ended up on different pages about what to do, and that led to really the loss of, I mean, Bobby had been such a source of strength for you for so right. long, and now, hey, we're on this different page, and it wasn't just like, you know, this situation happened, and then the next day you came and no. asked for help. No. There were years, years. in there yes. where years. you were living in this place of what do I do with this? Right. And you, I mean, I, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, yeah. but from what we've talked about, you really lost a big part of yourself because you didn't know what to do with the confusion of how do I find myself in the midst of a disagreement with him? Mm -hmm. Very true, and um, Todd is right. It, yeah. was, it was years. <laughs> um, and in this prayer time, that was coming up for me. Um, you know, and I think in the past with prayer times, I was like kind of anxious and, you know, but this one I really knew the Lord was doing something really for Bobby and I. And through Bobby and I, he wanted to touch us and really bring us back together. But we just didn't really know how that was going to work. And um, where my heart was, was, uh, I saw Hillary in the hallway and we're going and I'm just like almost skipping into the thing. You know, I was just like so ready. I was so ready to have the Lord put his hand to it. And we're still in the process. Um, but the, the deliverance for me is the Lord's hand is upon it. It's not mine to carry. And that Bobby and I both, he's healing our hearts in that situation and really coming together in that situation. Yeah. So Sharon's saying there's still a process to be walked out, but what, it, again, I want, I want to ask this question while you're up there so that yeah. when, later when I'm teaching and saying, just like Sharon said, it's actually true that you can, you can <laughs> nod and agree, that what happened, it was that, that disagreement, you lost, you, I mean, there was a sense of, I don't know what's going to happen here, a loss of hope, a loss of future, a loss of your voice just a sense of this is, I guess this is just my lot in life. Mm -hmm. And yet then someone came along and said, no, this isn't the end of the story. We don't know how this is going to work out. We don't know how God's going to bring you back together, but you've gotten lost in this picture. Let's pray for you. And now what's currently in the process of being worked out is Sharon now has her voice back because she has hope. I don't know how this is going to work out, but here's what I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to, I'm going to say what I think again, and I'm not going to just be hopeless that it's going to end in disagreement. Right. 
I'm going to have hope that God's going to work with your perspective, your perspective, and actually form something even better than either of you. I mean, this is the promise of marriage, is that God's going to form something better out of the union than just the sum of its parts. There's truly something miraculous involved here. And that's what's happening is he's bringing, because you've had the courage to say, okay, I believe this is not the end of the story, God is using this thing that the enemy meant for harm to bring an end to the unity of your marriage, an end to your hope, an end to your voice, and really a, a crushing of your personality. God's now using it actually to bring more of who you are out, yeah. to strengthen your voice, to improve your relationship with Bobby, and to improve the unity in your marriage so that you can have the impact in the big picture. And that's, you again, you're not all the way there yet, but you have, both of you have hope for that. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Did I pre, I kind of preached a whole sermon there, but I, no, that's, that's she, I, I'm not putting words in. This is really no, what she thinks. About, yeah. No, we, we shared. I'm just a professional talker. That's yes, all. and I am not. <laughs> but, but you did a great know. job. I mean, I'm not trying to take, take away from what you said. I just wanted to clarify, yeah. this is how this stuff works. The enemy gets involved and says, you, you know, this is hopeless. But it's not just hopeless, it's actually you're hopeless, and you just got to learn to live with it. But it really crushes us and steals life uh, in the process, and that's really, a, that's the enemy's goal. Well, can I ask you one more question about the whole situation? Where was God? I mean, now it's like there's hope because, oh God, you have a future. When things felt hopeless, what were your prayers like? What what was, what was it like to try to connect with God on that subject? Or did you? For me, it was, um, I remember the verse in Matthew that says, come to all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. And that's where I landed a lot of times. Mm -hmm. It was the place in him I can find the rest. Mm -hmm. In him I can find that peace yeah. that I need. Yeah. And did you, did you, did you, was it pretty consistent all the way through that you were able to just come and unload that burden throughout from the time of that no. tragedy to, <laughs> or did you have ups and downs I with that? I had ups and downs. Yeah. I very much uh, didn't know if Bobby and I were going to make it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I thought if we didn't have the Lord in our lives, we probably wouldn't be making it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the depth that we went. Sure. And I'm guessing that it probably made you question, do we have the Lord in our lives? Yeah. Where are you, God, in all of this? I knew God was there. Yeah, yeah. Even I knew God was there. Yeah. But I just needed his help. Yeah, yeah. In dealing with the situation. Thank you so much for letting, for sharing this and for letting me ask follow-up questions. I know it can feel like 20 questions. Yeah. But we all need examples. How does this actually work? And how can I have hope for what feels like it's hopeless? And what is utterly obvious to everyone here, myself included, is that the sparkle in your eye says there's hope. Yep. Uh, we don't doubt that you're in process, but we don't doubt that God's going to win because he's already begun. Yes, he has. So awesome. Thank, thank you guys you. so much for sharing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Bobby. Appreciate it. Okay. Love you guys. All right, so the title I've given this, uh, this evening's message is, Why is this happening to me? Deliverance is the big subject, but the specific question is, Why is this happening to me? And this is, I would say, the number one question that I hear believers wrestling with in a way that isn't actually helpful. Why? And it's, it's usually, Why, God? Why, God? And unbelievers, people who want to believe in God but are struggling to be able to find a place to put their faith, ask a similar question. It's actually exactly the same question, but it's just asked from a different theological starting point. And the question is, how could a good God allow so much suffering in the world? It's asked from kind of a more distant, I'm not connected to this thing, but it's really the same question, God, why, why, why? And I, 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 what I want to drive home this evening is that, that those questions 
presuppose something about God that the Bible doesn't actually say. And here's what it is. Those questions presuppose that God is actually completely in control of every event and that he has some good reason for why everything happens. Why, God? Am I supposed to get something out of this? Those kinds of questions, how could a good God, you know, how could a good God let so much suffering? It presupposes that God has allowed suffering because he's trying to get something good out of it. He has a purpose behind it. When the Bible never says that, it says things that you could misinterpret as that, but it doesn't actually say that. The verse that's the very closest to saying that, that doesn't actually say that, is this one. It's Romans 8.28. It's a verse many of us are familiar with and we hold on to, but I would say this is one of the most often misunderstood verses of the Bible because people misinterpret it as saying that God actually is the cause of all things and that there is a good thing that he has in mind to do And that's why the bad things are happening is because he has something good that he wants to have come out of it. And I have just never seen a situation where when we're asking, God, why is this happening to me? Where there's actually, well, let me explain to you why you have cancer. And it's really going to be a good thing in the end. Now, the fact that God can do something good with the cancer, that's what this verse is saying. He can force something that was not part of his plan. God is the God of backup plan upon backup plan upon backup plan upon backup plan. But the evil, the original evil, was not part of his plan. So when we ask God, why evil, why suffering, it presupposes that that was God's idea to start with. When God says, no, 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 what I am all about is life and blessing and good, and everything that I'm about is to overturn the works of the enemy. And the real source of the problem is not that God is creating all these things that are bad that he wants to somehow do something good with. It's that this this is the story that's given again and again from from the first pages of the Bible to the last pages of the Bible. It points the finger at the devil and says, says the enemy... Evil came into the world through a rebellious being called the devil who tricked people, deceived people, and it says that Jesus is the one who has come to destroy the works of the evil one. So again, this idea, it's easy to misinterpret. I mean, it says, right, well, look, right, that God causes all things. But that's not actually what Paul is saying here. He's saying God causes all things, whether good or bad, to, he can force things, both that he planned and things that were unplanned, to work together for good. He can force these unplanned events to turn out somehow for our blessing, and that's why we just say hallelujah. But it is not that that was uh, his purpose from the beginning. We read this (coughs) wild passage last week uh, in first service from Daniel chapter 10 where uh, Daniel is praying, God, answer my prayers. And then, sure enough, an angel shows up three weeks later, and the angel tells this kind of mind-bending story. The angel says, hey, listen, God heard your prayer, and he sent me right away. But I've been delayed for 21 days because the prince of Persia, this demonic force, engaged me in battle, and I couldn't overcome him by myself, so I had to send for Michael, the archangel, to come and help me, and when he showed up, we whomped on him, and then I was able to come. Daniel prayed. God's like, okay, I'll send an angel. God's plan was for the angel to show up 21 days earlier. I'm not making this up. This is the Bible. You can read it. It's Daniel chapter 10. God sends the angel. The angel says, I've been delayed. Now, I don't know about your English dictionary, but in mine, the word delayed means that there was a different plan that got thwarted by some unforeseen obstacle, right? The angel was sent. The plan was for the angel to show up right when Daniel prayed, but this other force came in and messed up with the plan 
And so Daniel was waiting for these 21 days that wasn't actually part of God's original plan. I can't explain all of that. (laughs) All I can say is this is the picture that the Bible paints is that God's plans are being messed with by rogue agents. He does not have this idea that God's sovereignty means that he has absolute control over every nitpick and little detail in the world. That idea is not found in the Bible. What you see in the Bible is a God who is struggling and fighting and warring blood, sweat, and tears against the power of the evil one. And he's constantly shocked and he's constantly stressed and he's constantly like, how, do we, how are we going to win this battle? Now, he's certain of victory because he's more powerful. He, the, the devil's just a created being. It's not like he's, he's really intimidated. But the point is that God has given delegated authority to these created beings by giving them free will and giving them autonomous authority to be able to impact the course of events and the flow of human history. And when he gives that authority, when he gives that free will, he doesn't take it back. Our choices and the choices of these other spiritual beings actually, he, you know, God isn't the only one calling the shots. He's the one who calls, he's the one who will call the final shots. He says, I am the beginning and I am the end. I know the beginning and I am the end because I started the beginning and boy, when it's time to be done, the curtains are going to drop. But in the meantime, we have a tremendous influence and so does the enemy over the way that the course of things turn out. And that explains a lot of why the Bible, as it describes God's reactions to human events, describes him as being, wow, that didn't go the way I thought that it would. Uh, And again, I can't explain to you all the metaphysics of how is it that God could be shocked, that his plans could be delayed, that he could regret making mankind and so send a flood. (laughs) That's a little above my pray grade. All I'm doing is saying that the idea that we have that God is in this metic- has meticulous control and has all these buttons and whistles, and, and so he, is, he has this master plan. No, the reason evil exists is because beings with free will decide not to go with his plan. There is no why for evil other than rebellion of, from free agents who say, forget you, God, And when you or I or other spiritual beings resist God's plan, that introduces death and destruction into our lives and into our world. The reason this is so important to understand is because throughout the Bible, this was the mentality. Nobody wrestled for ages with, oh God, what's the good reason you have behind this terrible thing? This idea that God is pulling the strings and has all everything all worked out, it really introduces apathy and hopelessness. It makes you feel like, well, then I guess I just got to wait for God to fix it. When in reality, God's saying, "Ah, this isn't my plan. This is against my plan. I'm not the source of the problem. The devil's the source of the problem. And it's actually my partnership with you, you exerting the authority that I've given you, and your free will partnered with my power, we can do some business because this is a battle. There's a war afoot. Now, the victory is secured, but how it all goes is really determined by who's willing to listen to God's voice, to follow with his plan of redeeming and restoring and healing and all of that stuff, And who's going to end up unwittingly partnering with the enemy in bringing death and ruination? Now, the bad guys lose and the good guys win, so the victory is secured. But there's a whole lot of God having backup plan upon backup plan upon backup plan upon backup plan upon backup plan, plan, depending on how many things go wrong and against the plan that he originally had. 
Everything I've said so far is biblical. I'm now going to step beyond what is biblical, and I can't prove this. But someone asked me a really good question after first service, and I thought maybe it would help you. They said, Where, what is the source of evil then? Where did it come from? How, did God create this thing that then we, you know, have to deal with? And maybe the answer I gave them would help you. The Bible doesn't specifically address that, and that's why I want to really clearly say everything I've said up till now, I'm just reiterating what the Bible says. This point, this is just the best I've come up with, and so if it helps you, then hallelujah. God created the world not to have evil in it. He created the world to have love in it. And love, by definition, is something that you have to be free to choose or reject. Uh, I'm married, and there are certain days that I wish that I could make love be something that would be automatically accepted. But if my wife automatically went with me on everything, she wouldn't actually love me anymore. It would just be she'd be a robot. Does that make sense? To be real love and to be real relationship, there has to be the risk of rejection. There has to be uh, the ability to say no thank you. I don't believe that God created evil. I simply think he created the world with the possibility of evil. Does that make sense? So that evil is really just when I say no thank you, it creates this vacuum called evil. And evil then just ends up being the absence of what God intended uh, for it to be. Now, the Bible describes evil, describes sin as having a force to it. So it's not that it's just nothingness. It actually has a force to it. But I picture it like a black hole. A black hole is essentially a nothingness. It is a void that seeks to suck everything into it. It's not a thing in and of itself that God intended to create. It's just he created the world with the possibility of, of this black hole called evil because the only way for there to be the opposite of the black hole, which is love, the only way for the world to really have the possibility of love, there had to be the possibility of rejecting love. Now, back to the Bible. <clears throat> Again, if that helps you. So Paul describes the world in these terms. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. He doesn't paint the world as a picture where God has all the bells and whistles and buttons and strings that he can pull. And so the way to understand life is to say, God, why is this happening? No, he says the way to understand reality is that God is good and he wants to equip you to battle against the forces that hate you and are trying to mess with God. God's plans. The trouble with this is we tend to, uh, you know, just in our, in our modern enlightenment thinking, uh, this idea that God is fully in control is more coherent when you come along with this idea that you know, rationalism and empiricism, rationalism says you can understand everything with your brain, and empiricism says, you know, truth can be assessed uh, by studying it. And the problem with the enemy, he doesn't fit into either of those things. So in modern evangelical Western church theology, the devil just kind of gets turned into this little guy with a pitchfork who's kind of like, eh, eh, do bad stuff. Eh, eh, eh. But it's just kind of an annoyance. We don't see the world the, the traumatic issues of our life, the traumatic issues in other people's lives, the traumatic issues of the world, we don't see them through the lens of Ephesians chapter 6. And so we end up with these massive philosophical, theological, you know, God, why? And we end up chasing our tails, and the enemy absolutely loves it because what ends up happening is we get distant from God. We're not experiencing, excuse me, we're not experiencing the hope and the life and the freedom and the breakthrough that he's promised because we're not assessing the problem correctly and we're not battling it uh, with the authority we've been given. And so in the ensuing hopelessness that we feel, we then end up just withdrawing from the Lord. And that's ultimately uh, the enemy's plan. But listen to the big picture of God's plan for our lives and the world. Listen to how from the very, like I said, from the first page to the end, 
the first pages talk about the enemy uh, getting us off track, but listen to the promise that God speaks of ultimately Jesus. He's speaking to the, to the serpent here in the garden. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. This is ultimately a prophecy of Jesus saying Jesus would stomp the serpent on the head. He's going to bruise you on the head, but listen to what the serpent is going to bruise him on the heel. So it's a prophecy of Jesus because Jesus is of the seed of woman. Remember that she's a virgin. Jesus is of the seed of woman together with the Holy Spirit. But it's also a prophecy of all of us, because all of us are also of the seed of woman. Everyone here have a mom. You are part of the seed of woman. And so Jesus is the first and foremost snake stomper. Hallelujah. But we also get to walk in that authority. This is the prophecy from the very beginning, is that he will always be nipping at your heels, but you will stomp on his head. Can I get an amen? So cool, huh? Again, just looking at the nature of reality as the Bible describes it, we tend to think in terms of, okay, Jesus came to forgive my sins, and that's true, but the ultimate purpose is to destroy the works of the devil. The Bible consistently puts the devil as the source of many of our problems. That does not mean we just get to get off and say, well, the devil made me do it. We have culpability in there, and there's lots of room for repentance, but there's still the ultimate goal is to throw the devil into the lake of fire at the end of the story, and this is the the, the main purpose. So really, it all comes down to, really, the whole message of the gospel is you can be freed from the power of the evil one. Listen to Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. There's a a promise, a reiterated promise of what God had spoken back there in Genesis. So how does this work practically in our lives? I'm going to wrap up with these verses. If you want to turn to them, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. It says, the Lord's bondservant, He's talking, this is Paul writing to Timothy, a young pastor talking about how to promote leaders in the church. And Paul is saying of these leaders that Timothy is going to promote in church, he's saying, hey, the leaders must not be quarrelsome. Now, of course, that's a big duh. You don't want people grumpy, vindictive, divisive, argumentative people as leaders, right? Because that'd be lame. Who wants to go to that kind of church, right? Right? But that's not actually the reason that Paul says. Listen, I'm going to read through this passage, but at the end, it gets at why don't you want them to be quarrelsome? And it's not just because you want them to be nice. It's not about being nice. It's about being able to be agents of deliverance, but I'm spilling the beans. Uh, uh, You must not be quarrelsome, must be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, verse 26, and that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So why must a leader be kind and gentle and not quarrelsome? It's because the jerks don't mean to do it. The people who make, when people make you feel unkind, ah, what's their problem? Chances are that struggle that they're having that's making you want to lash out, they're not doing that on purpose. So the reason the leaders in the church must be kind is because God sees you and me for who we really are. He knows that's not really you. That's not your heart. You've been dragged away into this place of judgment or bitterness or anger or rejection, and you're just lashing out because you're being lashed apart from within. And and, and God says, I want leaders who will never lose sight of who people really are. They must be kind because God is kind. He really sees the difference between where I've ended up and where I'm really struggling. 
And he always speaks to me on the basis of what's really, really true of me. He never reacts to my brokenness. He always says, come on, there's hope for you. Come on, it's, this isn't the end of the story. And so that's why leaders must not be quarrelsome. It's because they'll end up fighting people over stuff that isn't really even people's real issues. So we want to have eyes for people. And that's really the first key to deliverance, is to have relationships with people that know you and love you, that you can trust enough to say how you're really thinking and what you're really feeling. And a lot of times it's going to be ugly. But you lay that stuff out on the table, and godly leaders we will be able and empowered by Jesus to help set you free from the places you've been held captive against your will. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much <clears throat> that you never do lose sight of us and that you appoint people in our lives that we, that can know us and love us and that know your ways and can really bring your life and your healing into our experience. Lord, I pray that you would increase our courage and faith to lay those things that we feel so shamed of and so just yeah, I wish that things were different, that we would bring that stuff out into the light, not to be exposed, to, but, but to be healed, that you would set us free so that we could become those snake stompers uh, that you intend for us to be. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we say, amen. All right, everyone, we'll see you around.